case. Here's the book. It's, a, it's really a fascinating read. But the mm -hmm. thing is, as I, as I was saying, uh, Linda Binkley did a review for the Italian American Heritage uh, Newsletter. And she did a very good review per Carmen. That's what Carmen said. And I, I agree. But uh, we're going to go into the lecture. And what I found really intriguing about Carmen's book is that he talks about it from a perspective of someone who lived through the experience. And I know he ironically said we were considered collateral damage. And I, that, that term stuck with me. Because in wars, they talk about the great generals and the great battles, but they don't talk about the people who had, who were collateral damage. And those collateral damages live with you for all your life. So I, I think Carmen had a really good spin on how he did his presentation. So we will have some question and answers after. But I want to turn this over to Carmen. He has a slideshow. We went over it. And, and then we will go into the lecture. And then later, you can email me or uh, text me on the, on the Zoom. And, and, I'll try, and I'll make a list of people who want the book. And we will have them for you. We have several pickup sites for the cannoli sites for the St. Joseph's Day. So there'll be ample time to pick up the book. So without further ado, uh, ado, and with the miracle of Zoom, we have Carmen at 10 o'clock in the evening uh, in, in uh, <laughs> Key, Key Biscayne, Florida. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so I hope it's warm there. <laughs> it is, it is. It's quite warm. Very nice, actually, okay. very comfortable. But uh, let, well, first of all, let me thank you, Ken. I really appreciate this. And also the... Italian American Heritage Foundation, and also David Brzezinski. Yes. <laughs> what a beautiful Polish name, I think. <laughs> exactly. So let me share the screen with you people. Okay. Uh, are we on? Yes. yes, we are. Okay. Well, the, the first slide is the, 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 the picture of the front cover of the book. The title of the book is Bitter Chicory to Sweet Espresso. Uh, when I retired uh, uh, when, uh, at, at Northeast University as a professor of physics, and I wrote scientific books. And uh, while I was doing it, I read many, many books about World War II. And one thing was missing is uh, about the victims. People like me were in Avella we suffered because of World War II. And after many titles, I came up with this title here, Bitter Chicory to Sweet Espresso. Because the beginning of the war, uh, there, there was no coffee beans, no sugar. People made coffee from chicory, dry leaves of chicory or flower buds of chicory. And without sugar, it was bitter. I was a little, uh, kid, the little bear, little brat, really. I used to run around and taste that coffee. It was bitter, but also reflected the times. They were bitter. And at the end of the war, when coffee beans were around and sugar was to be had, then there were cafes all around town and the aroma was unbelievably sweet. And there were better times at the end of the war, of course. So that's where the title comes from. It's a metaphor. So I've given a talk uh, last week, actually, a week ago in, uh, at, the, at the community center. And there the title I changed a little bit, Growing Up in Napoli's Backyard During World War II. In some sense, the town where I come from is in, in the backyard of Naples, Italy. The word Napoli is really a Greek word, as, as you shall see. Let me summarize for you what the book more or less is about. In some sense, it's, uh, well, before I do that, it's about heritage, where we come from and all that. But anyway, uh, let me 
introduced Leonardo da Vinci, he said there are three classes of people. Those who see, those who see when they are shown, and those who do not see. I, I, I believe there's a fourth class, which says that those who choose to see. And I hope you people choose to hear my talk and tell you what I've seen and heard during that, those times over there in World War II. So let me now summarize for you what the book more or less is about. And I took this one comment from one of the reviews I've had. It says the following, as much a history of the town and region as it is a personal one, this is an important work, a necessary one. It reveals the human spirit in the face of adversity. As the Neapolitan credo that serves as an epigraph reminds us, Chandranjamo, that means we adapt to survive. It's so true. We survived, I don't know how many invasions of the area. But let me take you to, to the beginning of, of time as far as we're concerned. And that's a map of Italy around 200 BC. As you can see, Italy was divided in many nomad tribes. The most important tribe for me was the Semonite and the Bolshevik is not named over here. And this is the Bay of Naples over here. And, I, and my, so the, the, the Semonites were basically shepherds and farmers. My mother was a shepherd. Her mother was a, one of these uh, leaders, right? if you want, a, uh, a matriarch of the shepherd tribe. And, and basically what, made, what they made the living from is dairy products, making ricotta, cheese, and things like that. And also they were farmers. The most important product they, they made, they produced was hazelnuts. And even those days, they import all over the world. And um, as you know, hazelnuts are, for, there are 18, you don't know that, I will tell you there are 18 species of hazelnuts. One of being a species called Abella in those days. And that's what the name of the my town was derived from, from Abella. You change B into V, you have the name Avella, that's my hometown. If you go to the Vatican and look for old maps, ancient maps, you'll find the town of Avella. Now, before the war, uh, my mother was married, had three children, and her father was in America. She, he sent money to her. Um, her husband was a barber and she had a side job working, uh, making ricotta cheese, whatever like that. So, and besides, he, she got perks from Mussolini for having children. So life was good. When the war broke out, my father died in Libya and um, she no longer got money from America. And here she was stuck with three children. And the only way to support her was making record. That's not enough. So we, we, ate, we ate for breakfast, we, polenta. Lunch, we had polenta. And dinner, we had polenta. And on Sunday, if somebody had a tomato, they would squeeze a tomato juice on it. And you make believe it was pasta. I mean, if you can believe that, but that's what it was. So let's start the show about how, where the war started as far as I was concerned. My uncle was stationed in Sicily. He was on his way to Libya to relieve the, the, the German army and the Italian army. At that time, Germany and Italy were allied. German troops were over here in Sicily as well as Italian troops. And the, the locals, the Sicilian, so the, the locals here in Sicily did not get along with the German troops 
as well as Italian troops. They were treated as enemy, both of them, not just the Germans. And, and the Germans did not really get along, really did not want to share their food with the Italian troops. For example, they used to have beautiful marmalade, but they would not share with them, with the Italian troops. And however, though, they had this dark bread, it was hard as anything, you could bounce it against the wall like a rubber ball. And they wanted to share that food or that bread with these locals, which they didn't want to do that. So that was a little bit uh, a strained relationship over there. I want to ask my uncle, I said, uh, Uncle Joe, did you ever shoot your cannon at anything? He said, yeah, we did. One time we saw a British plane overhead and we shot at him 10, 12 times, but we never hit him. They were too far up in the air to, to, to hit him. And therefore, you know what happened? The, the invasion of the avalanche happened right after that. There was a, you know, a way to find out who's, where, where the troops were. So anyway, to make the story short, the, the British landed over here in Siragusa over here and the Americans landed in Jela over here. And they went this way and that way toward Messina. And they drove the Germans and the Italian troops toward Messina over there. If you don't know, there's a fault line right at Messina. And nowadays they want to build a bridge right over. They're nuts, they'll never work. But anyway, um, the, 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 the German troops and the Italian troops did not have any radar so they could take a ship and go across. What they did, they took ferry boats at night, they made it across into the mainland, into Calabria. Now, at that point, the Italian troops were rounded up and put onto trucks to be delivered to Germany, including my uncle. So, and this was in, in, in late July of 1943. 1943, and so this notion that that the the that the Germans occupied Italy in, in September 10, 1943, it's partially true. No, no, it happened much earlier, more like July 27, because I know for a fact my uncle was rounded up on a German troop. Let me show you how uh, where where the trip back home, it was made. Now, the German troops retreat along this line over here. Now it's, some people call the Appian Way, Appia Way, Via Via Appia. It goes this way, up that way, and like so, up here and up to Rome all the way. I ever though, any road that the Romans made was all was called Via Appia. So there was another road which Via Appia went this way, like so to Brindisi. Brindisi was a very important city because a lot of the generals and emperors they, they wanted to get away from Rome because the other guy won, the other emperor won, they would go to Brindisi, across to across to Athens or Middle East. And so on, or they, or the, they, they use the Appian way to go to Sicily to get their grains. But anyway, those were the main roads from Rome all on forward. So here's what happened: it was July, very very hot, and 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 the Germans were also hot. They took off their clothes and they went swimming. Beautiful beaches in Calabria, unbelievable beaches. Ken knows all about them, right? Yeah. And uh, so they they went swimming, and guess what? They left the truck all alone, no German troops, no nothing. And guess what? Those twenty Italian troop uh, soldiers did. They took off. I said, "Thank you very much." Some went this way, some went south, and some, like three of them, my uncle and two from Mavella went along this, they didn't go along the main highway, but they went along the coastal road, like this, all the way to their hometown, over there, Avella, Avella someplace over there. Now, um, I, you know, I'm getting old, I forget, okay, so 
he, he took the route this way and the Germans over there retreating along this line over there. So when he got, when they got to Salerno, one of the Avella soldier stopped over here. And he said, you know, that's good enough for me because I have some friends over here and stay there. That was a mistake. As you all know, the Allied troops landed in Salerno on another invasion. Whereas my uncle, what he did, he went along this way up to Avella and the Germans went the other way. Okay, let me show you in more detail what happened. There, to repeat, he went across um, above the mountains, above um, Amalfi, along this road over here, and then he took this road to here. And this thought, what his thinking was, once I get to here, I'm gonna to get to the railroad station from Nola to Avella, that's the town over here. Whereas the Germans came, troops came this way, like so, and up north, retreating that way, and also they went to Nola. And guess what? Even though my uncle beat the Germans to Salerno, the Germans got to Nola before he did. So he had to walk around up the mountains again into Avella. Poor guy, 125 miles walking. Can you imagine that? Unbelievable. So when he, once he got to Avella, he hid. He, he, hid, he hid away you know, from anything. Now, let me then get to the next slide. Let me show you why is it this valley is so important. Why a lot of people, a lot of countries invaded this area here. First of all, it's very fertile. This is Marzano. Your tomatoes come from this area over here, Marzano. Okay, here's Avella, Montevella is here. There's a castle right over here. And every country in the past or in the future have invaded this area so many times, but each time they've survived every single invasion. And I ask myself, it's not a question who invaded, who did not invade this area. Everybody has invaded. The Normans, the French, the Hans, Attila the Hans, the Scandinavians have come over here, the Greeks have come over here, and so on and so forth. But we all have survived every single invasion. Now, let me show you a view of the valley over there. I'll get you here. So now this is a castle in Avella. It's called a Norman Castello Normano di Avella and Vesuvius. This is Vesuvius. The Bay of Naples here. Now is over here. Avella is right below the castle there. And the valley is over there. So now let me show you another view. And this is from Montevella. The castle is here. Nal is here. Vesuvius is over there. The Bay of Naples is over here. Posillipo is here. And Puzzoli someplace over there. And Vesuvius on the other side over there. And the Amalfi Sorrento coastline is down there. Now, any soldier would understand you have a beautiful view here. It's easy to defend the valley. You can have, you can see anybody, you can see a fly coming into the Bay of Naples. You can see anything over there. Okay. So the Germans came this way and came to my town of Avell over here. Okay. So the Germans camped in the uh, top of this mountain here toward Bayano over here. Now, I remember that time. I, I was down my grandfather, no, no, down my grandfather's place. And there was a rumor that there were troops coming in the town by the cemetery. And so my grandfather, no, no, put me on his shoulder and he dragged me along. I don't know why he took me along. I have no idea, but there I came along. And by the time we reached this dirt road by the cemetery, there was a huge tank, 
a tiger tank. It took up the whole dirt road. The only way to go around it was going into a ditch. Otherwise, you'd be run over. The, these people were intimidating. They didn't come there to be friends. They were there to intimidate you. And, uh, and we were, you know, I was really afraid, even though I was a little, little kid. And, um, and so, and they, and they talked to my grandfather and they, and they asked them, are there any caves around? And, uh, and he said, yeah, there's a big cave right over here. And he was pointing the finger over there. There's Montevel over here, over there. But he didn't tell them there were two little, two caves here and there only 200 yards from his farm. The farm, his farm is over there. By the way, this is the, a Roman amphitheater. I like to call it a small Colosseum, like the one in Rome. Now, there are eight of those type of Colosseums spread all over the, from Rome to Naples to North Africa, eight of them. And this is one of them in Avella. Now it was built by, by Emperor Sulla. See what happened was in those days when Rome was expanding and they wanted to, they wanted to conquer the, the, the Semnites, they, had a, they battled the Semnites and Avella allied with the Romans against the Semnites. And of course the Romans won and they were rewarded. They were rewarded in terms of getting Roman citizenship and also the Empress Sula built an amphitheater or Colosseum. Now, when I wrote the word Colosseum, I remember one time I was advertising about the Colosseum and all this and that, I was reprimanded by a lot of aficionados of Colosseum. I was told there's only one Colosseum and that's in Rome. That's an amphitheater, there's a difference. Well, I want to be stubborn about it. I won't call this a Colosseum, okay? <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the Germans came here. And uh, so one night, I remember, there was such a large, big explosion, unbelievable, in the middle of the night. Because at that time, the, the Vesuvius was active. And we had these tremors from the Vesuvius. And every time we had those, uh, the whole family would stand under the door. So in case the building would fall, you would not get hurt. But anyway, one night, it was more than just a, a tremor. It was a loud noise. So my mother and I, and my brother went up on the roof and trying to see where that noise was coming from. Well, it was not the Bay of Naples. It turned out to be Salerno the Allies invaded Salerno, as you all know. The, this is called the Husky, Allied Invasion of Husky. It happened September 9, 1943. The, the, German, the, the United States Army invaded this way, the British that way, and a small contingent of British troops over there. I, you know, I, for years, I tried to figure out or who came to, to Avella, my town. And um, I wish I had this map before because it would have told me. It would have told me that Hermann Goring Division and the 15th Panther Division came to Avella. I mean, I wish I had this map earlier. It took me quite a while to figure out from all the literature I read who, what troops came to town. But anyway, and they came over there. And what happened was when the, when the Allied army came in, they had these British troops, these Scottish bagpipe the players, they played the, the bagpipes over there. And it was very happy, go lucky, uh, you know, very nice music. They came into Main Square and the Piazza and all that. And, all, and they were marching toward my grandfather's farm. And little did he know, they took over his farm. <laughs> so when he found out from his, from his personnel, I don't even say in, in English, personnel is the manager of the farm. He was informed that the British took over his farm. So the first thing my, 
my grandfather did, the nonna did, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So again, he took me by the hand this time. He didn't put me on his shoulder. And we went to this English, the, the, the English farm. Let me show you where it is. So here's his farm over there. Let me tell you the layout of the land. Here's his farm. The, the two caves I was talking about is here and there. And, uh, and right below, this is a dirt road. Right about here, there's a fault line, earthquake fault line. The, the, the ground fell eight feet. And right over here is a Colosseum, only about 100 yards from, the, from my grandfather's farm. So, so here we are, we went to this, uh, to this farm over here. Now it was taken over by the British and they built little houses made out of uh, wood. And, and you went from one building to another and the way the British had it, they, 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 they took some stones and they painted them white and they built like little roads so that they guide you from one building to another. So we go to one building, my grandfather and I, and we fill out a lot of papers and so forth. And so my, my, my grandfather went there, basically put his hand out and say, how about it? Give me some money, give me something for my farm. And so the British were, the British were, were very polite, very courteous. And they said, we need to fill out some papers. So he did that and wait here, two hours, we waited. And I was getting fidgety, I was getting impatient. And so then they said, go to building so-and-so. We go there and we walk over there on the other side. And, and same thing, questions, we wait, drill around. At the end of the day, after about, I don't know, seven, eight hours, guess what? He was handed a loaf of bread. Have you ever eaten this wonder bread, wonder bread, white bread, sliced bread? But this thing was not sliced, it was white bread. It's typical British bread. Oh, it's better than nothing, better than polenta. So he took it with him and he cut it up and he toasted it. And he shared it with the whole family, you know, what else can you do? So the next day we went there again, another loaf of bread and on and on every day. And, you know, think about this. This is about October, November time frame around that time. Even there, it gets a little bit nippy. It gets a little bit cold. And I didn't. I told my mom, I don't want to go there anymore. It's goddamn cold. So she said, don't worry, I'll, I'll talk to them. So my grandfather shows up and said, no, no, I have a better way to get home. So when we went home, he said, no, what? instead of going this way back to, to, to town, let's go back this way toward this big building. Now, mind you, Here's his Colosseum, it was all covered up with trees, ivies, edges, and stones all over the place. And so, and here's my, my grandfather pushing rocks away, I, cutting up ivies, pushing hedges along, trying to find, and there's a big portone, big door, about 30, 40 feet high. And he couldn't figure out what it was, what building was that about. So finally he got to the door, he pushed the door, and guess what I was doing? I was, you know, when you, when you have big black ants, they dig holes, they were coming out of the hole, and I was trying to plug in the holes, and I keep, and I keep losing. Every time I plug one hole, there was another hole, and I plugged that hole, and there was another hole, and back and forth, and the ants won. I always, it was frustrating. And while my, my grandfather was pushing this big door, finally he opened that door and said, come over here. That time my name was Miguel, not Carmen, by the way, in honor of my father. So anyway, he said, come over here, Miguel. So I look at, oh my God, what a view. That was a, the, the amphitheater. And ask yourself, why was it covered up? i tell you why. Because the farmer who's raising, making, I mean, producing hazelnut, they not want to give the land to the state because once the state found out there was a Colosseum, then they would have bought the land cheaply and he would lose twice. Not only would he have to sell the land very cheaply, then he would lose his business, the hazelnut. So he covered up with ivies and trees, you name. So for many years, the thing was covered, okay? Besides the British, there were other colonial troops over here, like uh, uh, Canadians, Australians, um, and also these 
North African troops. These are called the Gumirs. These are troops from Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. Now, they raised hell on earth. You know, there's a, a famous uh, Italian poet, Dante Alighieri. Uh, most of you know who he is. He, he talked about hell and heaven and purgatory. And to him, you know, it was an abstract thing about hell. Well, these people here, they made hell on earth. They raped anything on two legs. And I mean that. I mean, the, the, the movie by Sophie Lauren, directed by Vittorio De Sica, about the, the, about the movie tells you all about it. I don't want to go into it. Now, let me tell you something about the, the, what happened those, the, those times. Now, this road here goes right about here is where my grandfather's house here, the caves are over there. And there's an intersection over there. And this is my house, my family's house over here. The bedroom's upstairs. And this is a portico over there. That's where the bathroom is. And the, a big sty sty is over here too. And German troops would come on, would come in this way. They would train in the morning, run from this side here, up that way, like so every day. Except, and you won't believe this. There were people here, standing here, watching these people running around. And it's absurd, but that's what they were doing. And so I ever know one day a truck came by and it picked up a teenager, screaming teenager. The screams were so loud, my mother and I came out and said, what the hell is going on? And they took this teenager away on a truck. Half hour later, an hour later, it came back. The, the truck came, went this way back on the road over there. They went to the house. They took the mother and the daughter away as well. Never to be seen again. Never to be seen again. I don't want to guess what happened, but your guess is as good as mine, okay? The, the Gumiers more or less did the same thing, except they would go into people's house and do some dirty business. They came and knocking on my, our portico here. And we, fortunately for us, we didn't hide in the, in the pigsty because when the Germans were around, we would hide in there because once we saw they deported this teenager, we start hiding in the pigsty to, to hide from the Germans. When the Gumiers came in, we didn't hide in there. We hid into, into cesspool with a, with a cover on top of it. Thank God, otherwise I don't know what would happen. Okay? Now, during the 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 the, the uh, German during the Salerno invasion, the Americans landed paratroopers from Avellino all the way to Chichano, Nola, a, a spread of thirty miles. They're supposed to have been landing in Avellino within one mile radius or diameter. They they landed within thirty miles diameter from Nola to Avellino. And, and, I, 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 and I remember that this is the, the cave of San, San Miguel Cave, at St. Michael. This is a place where every Christmas people would go up to the cave and celebrate the mass at Christmas time inside the cave. Now, as a kid, I remember going up, this is right on, along up to Mount, above this cave is Mount Avella. There were wires hanging from the side over here. And I would ask the adults uh, and say, what are the wires from? What, what's, what are they? And they said, go away, little kid, you little, you little brat, get away. And so they, they would tell me to get lost. And you won't believe this, 50 years later, I, uh, I attended a conference in 
San Antonio, Texas. And I talked to one of the, one of the sponsor of the conference, I forget his name, it was, uh, oh yes, Albanese. His name was Albanese. And I talked to him because as a professor, one thing you wanna do is to hustle for money. And he had a lots of money, government money. He worked for the Air Force. So he says to me, Carmen, you know, I was once a tourist of, of your area. I said, oh, that's nice. I said, where'd you go? He said, I'm in Lino, or in fact, near a cave. I landed on top of a cave. I said, yes, and what year was that? 1943. I said, what do you mean? You were no tourist. I said, you must have been one of those paratroopers. So yeah, I was. And he said, I was a, a radio man. In those days, they call everything a radio man. What he was, he was setting up a transmission, uh, radio transmission with the Allied troops or, or Navy ships in the, in the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean Sea. And he was stationed over there above there. And I asked him, Did you, what else happened? He said, well, we blew up a bridge. I said, well, what bridge was that? I said, there's only one bridge, I said. I know which bridge it was. Let me show which one it was. There it is, that's the bridge. It goes over the so-called the Clanio uh, Creek. Now, the, the, the Clanio Creek goes right below the, the cave, San Miguel uh, uh, Cave. And, and the thing about around December, when you go to that uh, mess for Christmas, sometimes it rains. If it rains, this is no longer a creek, it becomes a river. This is full of water. So if you went to church, let's say at 12 o'clock, and then it rained during church, you couldn't get back home anymore. <laughs> You'd have to wait till the water subsided before you went across the, the creek. And so this is the creek, uh, this is the, the bridge that they blew up. The Americans did that. The reason they did that because the Germans had a, a, a station of tanks uh, tiger tanks right on the other side over here because they, they, they prevented them from going across the bridge into, into Via Appia back to Rome. They, they wanted to stop that. It reinforced, reinforced the Salerno uh, soldiers, German soldiers. Now, now, the Germans retreated to Monte Cassino. How am I done with time? Do you want me to speed up, Ken? We're, uh, we're doing good. Doing okay. Good. They retreated to uh, Monte Cassino right here. Now, the thing about Monte Cassino is it it's all full of caves on this side here, over there. And so when the Allied Air Force bombed uh, Monte Cassino, well, they, um, they never hit the German troops. They hide under the caves and they came back out again. In the meantime, the Abbey was killed. And a lot of colonial, colonial troops tried to take Casino the hard way, up the hill, especially Polish troops. They, they went up this way, the zigzag road. They suffered greatly, uh, unbelievable amount. In fact, if you go there, there's a, there's a, a big, cross of it, built by the Polish uh, people over there. It's, uh, it's something to see if you ever go there at Monte Cassino. Now, uh, what happened there, this is, by the way, is Via Casilina, goes all the way to Rome. And so and there was a stalemate for a long, long time. And so what the Allies did was, okay, why don't we go around and, and land at Anzio? At the same time, at the same time, they landed the Gomirs right about over here and on this side over here. They were really mountain troops, these Gomirs, and they liked to fight at night, and they only use one weapon, a, a knife. They liked to cut people's throat, German soldiers, and they were vicious. You know, that's, uh, in fact, some of these German troops were Russian 
uh, uh, Russian soldiers. They said they, they, they wish they were back in Russia instead of over here fighting the Gomiers. But anyway, in order to relieve the Monte Cassino front, the, the Americans landed at Anzio and the British landed at Netuno with the sole purpose to block the retreat from the, the Monte Cassino and, and stop the road. This is Via Casalina, it went right by Cassino. They, they wanted the, ob, the object or the plan was to go to Van Montono and then, and then um, uh, trap the German army back over there, 10th Army over there at the Monte Cassino. What happened was just the opposite happened. What happened is the following. We landed troops over there and it was a complete surprise. In fact, it was so, such a surprise at two o'clock in the morning, 2.30 in the morning on January 22nd, 1944, that the German soldiers didn't have time to put their pants on. They actually, we, we, caught, we caught them with their pants down, okay? And at 8.30, at 9, 830 by nine o'clock, uh, Lieutenant Cunningham got himself in, into a Jeep with three other soldiers. He drove this route over here, along this road over here, and then this way like so, into Rome. He did not encounter one single soldier. He came back, back to here at Anzio, and, uh, and he reported it, and they, we didn't do anything about it. What happened was the, the general in charge built up his, uh, uh, his uh, tanks, cannons, food, supplies, the whole works, building up over there. In the meantime, Within nine days, the Germans took possession of the high hills over here, the Alban Hills, Castelli Roman, where the Pope lives, and high mountains over there, and they were shooting down at Anzio. And, and in fact, it, it was a miracle they did not push back into the sea, thanks to the Navy over here shooting back. It was a stalemate. So instead of this relieved Casino, it was the other way around. Casino relieved Anzio, okay? Now, um, I'm not going to go into what I did here. I'll, I'll tell you more about the next slide here. Oh, no, uh, it's, it's too mathematical. Some people do not, uh, okay. While this is happening at Anzio, and Casino, there was a little bit of a problem at the Via Rosella. Now, we, we had uh, German police troops marching along the Via Rosella every day. These were not German uh, soldiers. They were soldiers from the town of Bolzano, Bolzano, Italy. They're not Germans. And they they, they, they were acting as policemen. They marched every day along Via Rosella. At that time, the partisans were very active and they placed a bomb in the, in the, in the ashtray can and, and exploded and 32, 33 Germans were killed. And you notice there were bullets here when the bomb exploded, the Germans thought that, hey, you know, we've been shot at from above these, these, these windows over there. Well, the point was that there were no, no partisans on these troops over there. And uh, in the year 2000, the, the Pope, Pope John, Pius, John Paul Pius II, wanted to have spruce up to Rome. And the people of Rosella said, said, no, no, leave it alone. We want that to be a part of what happened to us in World War II. Now, for every German soldier killed, 10 civilians were killed. But instead of killing 330 civilians, 
335 were killed. After the war, the, 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 the 330 did not matter. The five extra ones didn't matter. And the, and the generals and the corporal and the captains and the, whoever was in charge of the killing of those civilians were taken to court. And they were accused for killing those five extra people, civilians like that. Not because they killed 330, but those five extra ones. Well, it is ridiculous. Now, the reason I show you the next one is because another uncle of mine, he was stationed there. He was picked up by the Germans because the Germans are very precise. They want to make sure that 330 civilians were, were going to be killed. So they went around with a truck in Rome picking up civilians. They picked up my uncle, one of my uncle. They took him right over there. By the way, this is Via Appia Antica. To the left is Via Appia. To the right is Via Ardetina. Now, right over here, there was a truck stopped right there. Just in case they will fall short of 330 civilian. So lucky for my uncle, they found they killed more than 330, 335. And they let go of my uncle. Thank God. And unbelievable, but true, true story. So, um, by the way, in the Via Appia, that's a place where St. Peter came and stopped and asked somebody for directions how to get to the Colosseum. In fact, there's a little church over there commemorating that right over here, the Appia. This is the museum where those 335 victims are located. I remember my wife and I visiting there many times, actually a couple of times. And I, and I wanted to see the pictures of the victims. Who were they? I, I, how old were they? How young were they? Who, the information about that. So I went to, to the museum there and they had pictures of generals and captains and priests and so on and bishops. I said, I said to the curator, can I see the pictures of the victims over there? He said, well, no, we don't have them. I said, why not? I want to know about them. I don't want to know about the general. That's the reason why we had those victims, because of the generals. And so the point I'm making here, what's the point of these monuments? I don't understand these monuments. And after that, I said, they don't make sense to me anymore. Again, this is the new abbey on Monte Cassino. This is a cemetery after the war. Again, if you go there, there's a big cross erected by the Polish people because they suffer greatly when they went up this way, up to, up to Monte Cassino. Now, this is uh, after the war. There was scores to settle. These are partisans. By and large, they were communists. And this is a, probably a fascist mayor, Podesta. And notice, at that time, there were no trials. They round them up and shot them. No trials, nothing. 15,000 fascists were killed at that time. I, I, I think, in my opinion, if I may express it, we had a civil war in Italy. We really did. They didn't call it civil war because they were afraid to call it to, to prevent from inciting one, the real one. Okay. Ah, this is the picture after the war. Uh, that's me over here, uh, the, the best looking guy over here, right there. And, uh, and that's uh, Suora Felicia, the, the nun Felicia means happiness. She was hard. The nuns were, I, I needed discipline. I was really, no, you know, I was like a scunizzo, you know, a street kid. I would run around the streets. I didn't take discipline very well, especially from nuns. Every time I did something wrong, they would grab my top of my top of my hand and they would twist it like that, like this, like so, and then slap her on top of it. And I needed discipline. And it was so bad for two years. 
And, and my mother, you know, she she was always arguing with the nuns. She she had a foul language. You know, being a shepherd, her language is not very clean. She had terrible things to say about nuns because she was always arguing about them scholarship because the nuns would say, hey, we could only give you half a scholarship. You have to pay for the other half a scholarship. And my and my mother made a big, big scene in front of none. She would call them everything in the book. I don't, I cannot quote them. They're very terrible. And uh, and so uh, you know, here I was. I was turning every shade of red, carnation red, red. I mean, really embarrassing. But anyway, and the nuns. They took their revenge on me, but <laughs> the, the, the turning point, the turning point was in my third grade. You know, my 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 Swar Felicia said to me, it said to me, you know, take take this uh, multiplication table, table, take it home. I want you to study and tell me multiply, uh, and then I'll, I'll quiz you on the on the thing. And. And I discovered I like math. So the next day she asked me all kinds of questions. I boom, 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 right away. And then she says, okay, you're so smart. Tell me what's 25 times 25. I said, 625. What? How did you figure that out? It's simple. I said, you take two, not square two, it's four, plus two is six. And 25 is always right, 625, 15. It's one square, it's one plus one, it's two, 225. She was amazing. And she said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, I got plans for you. I said, okay, what is it? She said, well, you see, we're always late for lunch, always late for lunch. And, um, and I have to cover history, geography and all that, and plus arithmetic and all that. Why don't you cover arithmetic while I do geography and history? <laughs> uh, history? I, uh, I looked at her. I was gagging. I said, what's wrong with her? <laughs> I, here I was with the worst guy in class. I was the baddest guy in class. And, you know, you know, what, what happened to my reputation here? <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I end up, you know, I play favoritism because now I can call the kids I like and didn't like, you know, to, to the to the board wall, to the board room, to the blackboard. To the board. Blackboard. Blackboard. And I played favorite there. She didn't mind. But we got to we got to eat earlier and have more food because it's the only meal for the day. You know, that was great. All right, that's the end of my talk. So now let me tell you. Oops. All right, these are reviews. When I wrote the book, when I wrote the book, I, I said, you know, Carmen, I know what mess are you getting in? I was, I was really worried about reviews. I said, you know, I write scientific books. I know what I'm doing. I, I, I know when I see an equation and I can tell about an equation or a graph or whatever like that. And the books I've written are pretty good. Here is totally different. I said, what the hell are you getting into? So thank God the reviews are not bad. They're pretty good. But of all the reviews, I like the one by Linda Binkley. She gave me very nice, and the first sentence, it says the following, this amazing book is a little difficult to review. Ah, I said, finally, a bad review. I like to hear that. <laughs> so I read the rest of it. I said, there are several ways to approach it. A memoir, an assessment of history, an inspiration, inspirational literature, Bit of chicory to sweet express is all three. I like that. I like. I think that's the best review. Thank you very much, Linda. Thanks. So you know, Carmen, you you opened up a lot of doors with this presentation. Really, I really want to thank you. If it was earlier time, I could talk the whole day, but I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Grazie. Buonasera. <laughs> Yeah, my good parents. Night, good, night, uh, good, good night. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. And we'll be in touch.